Palantir stock performed considerably well last year in its first few months of trading, but shares have dropped by almost half from January highs not that long ago. At around $23 a share, the stock isn't necessarily cheap as no good growth companies are, but after a strong 2020 year and continued growth expectations in 2021, PLTR could be cheap enough to start or add to a position. Is now the time? Let's explore. Last year, the company reported an exceptional 47% year-over-year revenue increase with an adjusted operating profit of $104 million. Palantir expects 30% revenue growth this year, so it's setting up for another improvement impressive year. Yet, despite the recent pullback, the stock trades at 27 times its revenue, a valid criticism I often hear. However, Palantir's multiple is actually lower than some related companies such as Datadog, which trades at around 50 times revenues, and Snowflake at around 150 times. So let me ask you a subjective question. Does Palantir deserve a higher multiple, and thus valuation, above its low $40 billion one today? That's what we're on a journey to answer in this video. And by the end, each of you watching should have an answer. Brought to you by Skillshare. Consider this a part two to one of my most popular videos of all time, but this time I'll be getting further into exactly where this company will be five years out. Given the stock sliding sideways at relative lows, Palantir's future may seem hazy at the moment, as we know institutional investors have been selling off growth plays. So in this video, I'm going to lay it all out in no uncertain terms where Palantir is today and where it is headed in the future, the end game, if you will. I firmly believe that Palantir is poised to become a truly disruptive software company given its involvement in both the commercial and government spaces. Regular viewers of the channel have heard this sort of commentary from me many times over. Today I've done some more research and will share some context that I haven't previously through the lens of long-term domination. Let's review the business model first. Palantir's revenue comes from two segments, the aforementioned government and commercial sector. How can they develop to be undeniable powerhouses over the next few years? Let's get into it. Foundry is known as the operation system hub for the modern enterprise and stands as the central decision support infrastructure for any organization in which it is installed. It translates data through models into knowledge that human operators can use to make better, more informed decisions. Let me lead into a deeper dive for a moment. Foundry's digital replication techniques provide a common interface for workflows by creating a two-way interface between digital and real-world operations, from search and analysis to supply chain optimization. Foundry's setup is dynamic, evolving over time to include more parts of the organization as they change. These models empower decisions from complex deep learning and artificial intelligence, or on the lower end, to basic logic and subsequent action. By mapping models to what power Palantir calls the ontology. It creates a system-wide simulation analysis that powers what-if analysis for users to understand a myriad of outcomes and associated consequences of hypothetical situations. The digital infrastructure is able to test changes and variations like cause and effects of switching suppliers, automation failures, and industry disruption to help companies adapt to these unexpected changes. So as you can expect, Palantir was awfully busy last year, as is evident from its growth numbers. Here's a little known truth. Palantir capitalizes off of entropy, or in simpler terms, disorder. 2020 was nothing but chaos, and imagine being in charge of a business that had to go through it. More on that later. But how can PLTR prove that it's the one to turn to when everything goes sideways? Here's a hint. How about a demonstration series getting into the specifics of a given business? And in any one of many industries. Well, that such video series will be underway soon. The footage shown here is from Palantir's demo day, which was in Q1, and this is Foundry's supply chain management. Using seasonal demand and corresponding production models for a certain organization, Foundry is able to analyze a complex value chain to answer questions by providing in-depth analytics. Foundry enables businesses to simulate various models to project issues such as a lack of inventory 
inventory anywhere in the given chain in order to identify any future supply constraints. Ultimately, in the next five years, it will become clear that Foundry is one of the most critical pieces of corporate digital infrastructure that exists. Right now, it's a matter of getting it out to more businesses. And if you doubt anything about Foundry, Palantir will have quite a show for you during its double-click event as it explains how this platform serves 40 different industries. Now moving on to PLTR's clandestine operations. Gotham serves as software for military applications and can render various potential outcomes. Gotham is extremely versatile and can identify patterns in data sets to find valuable data, identify threats, and much more than I can list in one video. Watch this clip from Demo Day of Gotham in its full glory. Even if you've already seen it, it's worth revisiting to review the scope and scale of this software in the right hands, of course. When thinking about the end game for a company and wanting to look many years out, TAM is one of my favorite metrics to look at. Palantir estimates that the total addressable market in its consulting space is $119 billion. That breaks down to the commercial space worth $56 billion and the government space at $63 billion. In the commercial space, the total addressable market is calculated by the number of customers with 6,000 companies with over $500 million dollars in revenue and this is then multiplied by the annual contract size which is around 10 million dollars a year the government sector tam comes from government agencies which align with liberal democracies the u.s government accounts for 26 billion dollars and international agencies for 37 billion dollars now since this is public information that has been presented by palantir management then investors are already aware of these figures but what i don't think investors expect is the following I think that in the next five years, Palantir will expand its reach, maybe up to its first thousand customers. For context, they're currently around 125 in varying spaces and industries. More users would allow it to continue to innovate on its platform development and how it applies AI for operations. The pandemic illustrated the potential for Palantir software, especially within the healthcare industry. For example, Palantir signed a two-year, $31 million contract 
contract with NHS England to assist the UK vaccine program in ordering, distributing, and tracking of vaccines through Foundry. Additionally, Palantir partnered with hospitals and government organizations to help manage medical supply chains, analyze efficient medical practices, and maximize hospital efficiency in operations. By utilizing Palantir, organizations are able to adapt to changing environments, and as the operating system for the modern enterprise, Foundry gives insights into decisions to generate alpha, the goal for any business. Furthermore, Palantir's software creates organic growth and value, and just as with the enterprise, I've realized that Palantir is going to become the default operating system for data across the entire U.S. government. As Tom Nash wisely pointed out, on one of the last contracts from the Navy, the government didn't even open up the bids for the contract. They just gave it to Palantir because nobody else can do what they do. In a few years, Palantir might just be the default for any sort of government software work. Think about how powerful that could be. This kind of means Palantir is nearing a monopoly in the government sector, and the flywheel I explained in a previous video will only continue to accelerate as Palantir goes on to attract, engage, and deliver in relation to every branch of the U.S. government. So let's take a look at financials. Palantir's five-year outlook projects $4 billion in revenue for 2025, but I think the guidance here is a real lowball, and Palantir could do much more in that time frame if they grow as I'm thinking they possibly can. Taking a step back, Palantir did roughly $1 billion in revenue in 2020. So for PLTR to 4x revenues in five years, that's roughly a growth rate of 32%, which is already what they're guiding for this year. My point is, Palantir could drastically beat this already impressive rate, ignoring the fact that they wouldn't be promising an unrealistic target and are hence naturally under promising. We know the team's sales force is building, has proven products on the market, and is now ready to execute on the deployment of its software. At the high end, if Palantir can double the growth rate to nearly 60%, they could do $10 billion in 2025. I know it's probably a stretch, but this is a software company after all, and one that gets to benefit strongly from recurring contracts. What compound annual growth rate do you think Palantir can maintain over the next five year period? I think it'll be somewhere between 30 and 60 percent most likely, solidifying itself as a growth company. In 2020, we saw a sharp increase in operating expenses from past years due to the employee stock compensation of over $800 million along with increased spending on the sales team and expansion in marketing as well as boosts in expenditures for research and development. As an investor, you just have to be fine with stock-based compensation being just that, a main part of employee compensation, considering that Palantir institutes a salary cap, making the maximum around 150 k I believe. It's just a new age way of paying workers, incentivizing them to focus on long-term goals, which is something you should be totally fine with if you're a long-term investor. So talking about the end game for Palantir, what's its competitive moat? Well, I believe it has a human capital advantage, as Palantir only hires top talent for its forward deployed engineers and just regular software engineers, pulling from elite institutions around the world. And it's worth pointing out that when Palantir has government contracts this deep handling top secret information, these types of deals are difficult to discontinue. Conversely, Palantir's competitors are found in lower DoD impact levels and have less influence with the government. Palantir has spent over 15 years working with the U.S. government and allied agencies, which has led to the buildup of trust and government-grade security, giving stability to its contracts. Palantir adds decades of experience over a variety of industries and creates a ton of value. And finally, Palantir has chosen to aid the U.S. and allied government agencies, which has allowed for a stronger customer base internationally and subsequently greater contracts since Palantir has put the American flag in the ground. But this company and the stock are not without risks. Palantir is currently unprofitable and will need to work hard to increase the expansion of contracts to maintain their close to 40% revenue growth year over year. So pulling back to the near term, what are some catalysts to be looking for for PLTR stock? So the recent share lockup expiration
operation, which began on February 18th, opened up over 80% of PLTR's shares for trading on the open market. And that has undoubtedly been weighing down the stock. But once the selling stops and some of the pre-scheduled insider trading ceases, I think the stock will have bottomed out by that point. And as I mentioned, Palantir has its double-click demo day coming up on the 14th of April to showcase how its platform is being utilized worldwide. And then the next big event will be Palantir announcing earnings for Q1 2020, which will be in likely the third or fourth week of May. So in conclusion, the bull case endgame for Palantir over the next five years is the company emerging victorious on higher growth, higher revenues, and profitability as the default solution for government and undeniable competitive edge for enterprise. As promised, I return to the question, does Palantir deserve a higher multiple? and thus valuation over the next five years? Or is it worth passing on this company? Again, it's subjective, as all investing is, and I can't answer that question for you, but I very much hope some of the points in this video were insightful. Hit like if you appreciated this production, and let me know your thoughts in the comments. I have a PLTR financial review video in the works. What do you want to see from that? And I want to give a huge shout out to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. For those of you who don't know, Skillshare Skillshare is an online learning platform with thousands of classes covering so many topics, even including investing, portfolio management, and options trading basics. It's also extremely affordable with an annual membership it comes in at less than $10 a month. I just finished watching Marquez Brownlee's masterclass on his approach to YouTube. Watching him has helped me refine my own workflow. And while that might not be a goal for you, there's something for everyone. Since Skillshare is sponsoring this video, they're offering you a special deal. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. So go ahead and follow the link in the description. Big thanks again to Skillshare. Until next time.